All right, I guess let's do this thing, huh? Chryso friends. Oh God, that's too fast. Chryso friends, welcome to CocoVid, Costume's online historical and fantastical costuming extravaganza. Firstly, I wanna take a moment to thank Noelle from Costuming Drama, Casey from Casey Birchfield, Faye from Faye Sterling, and everyone else who has worked so hard on the back end of this event, doing admin work and organizing things, running different areas and social events. This took an awful lot of work, and I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and thank everyone who made this possible. To all my current viewers and subscribers, it's so wonderful to see you again. And to everyone new who discovered my channel through CocoVid, welcome. As usual, be sure to like and subscribe to have more content like this in your life. And if you're the kind of person who likes getting notified when new videos go out, make sure to click the little bell and YouTube will send you notifications like Christmas gifts only every other Friday or so. This video is going to be less of my usual Courtney makes things video and more of a Courtney talks through concepts with helpful photographs video. If you're not familiar with the concept of a capsule wardrobe, it's a set number of items of clothing that can be mixed and matched to create a variety of different outfits. It's an idea that most people apply to a modern closet, but I have found it to be an incredibly useful approach to take with my historical clothing as well. In the SCA, there is an unspoken pressure to never appear in the same outfit twice, especially if you're landed nobility or royalty. Well, I understand, even though I don't agree with, the idea of portraying the conspicuous consumption that gripped the upper classes at all points in history. Our easy access to industrial produced materials and clothing has a tendency to skew our perception of what conspicuous consumption actually was, historically speaking. This isn't going to be a video on wills and clothing dispensations and sumptuary laws, although those are all amazing resources to see what people were wearing and how much of it they owned at any given period of history. No, this is going to be an exploration of how to build a wardrobe that will not overwhelm you, but contains enough variety of combination to keep you feeling sartorially fresh. Capsule wardrobes can be useful for something as broad as complete wardrobe planning, or for something as focused as planning what to pack for a week or two week long event such as Pensick within the SCA. Firstly, I do want to address a bit of an elephant in the room. How do we reckon with a very heavily gendered past while validating the lived reality and experiences of those costumers and clothiers who exist outside of or in between the gender binary? By understanding that gender non-conforming people did exist throughout history, even though they may not have used the same language that we do today to describe their experiences. By decolonizing the dominant and frankly Eurocentric idea of the gender binary, there are so many cultures around the world that have historically recognized more than two genders. And by accepting that clothing has no inherent gender and deciding to do away with the notion of men's and women's clothing. Instead, I will be referring to clothing as masculine and feminine as an indicator of the way clothing was worn by people in the past and the resulting gendered cultural coding of those people. The next point of interest we'll need to address is exactly when and where we are planning our wardrobe for. Considering that the medieval period is widely recognized to be any time between 500 and 1500 CE, that gives us a wide range of styles to choose from. Because my own interest lies between 1350 and 1400, that is the period I will be concentrating on for the purposes of this video. I will also be concentrating on the broad category of insular and Western Europe. Aside from outliers like Spain, some Italian city-states, and what would later become known as Germany, Western Europe was more or less broadly sartorially similar during this period. We'll be starting our wardrobe from the skin out as is appropriate, since proper foundational garments are key to all eras. Oh, incidentally, shoes were similar for both masculine and feminine people, being either low-cut shoes with a securing strap over the arch, or ankle-high boots, both pointed at the toe. On the feminine side, we'll be starting with a plain linen smock, long-sleeved and falling between the knee and ankle in length. This garment is known by several different names, shift, sark, chemise, smock, depending on the geographical area you're looking at. Of interest to the people of the feminine persuasion, there is some evidence for more dedicated underwear in the sense that we know today. There are a couple of extant bra-like garments from both before and after the time period we're aiming for today, and some references in text to below-the-waist underwear. 
Sadly, none of these nether region undergarments exist today, and we have no indications as to how the text-referenced underwear might have been constructed. The purpose of these undergarments is twofold, to wick away sweat from the body in hot weather and to protect the outer clothing, not usually made of such easily laundered fabric as linen, from sweat and body oils. As such, most people would have possessed more than one of these items to change out in between laundry days. With our modern laundry facilities, it's possible to have only one of these garments, but if you're designing your capsule wardrobe to take to a several day event, such as an SCA war, it's advisable to bring more than one. Depending on how much you exert yourself, this can range from one shift per day to one every two to four days. I would recommend hanging them to air dry in between wearing and perhaps spraying them with an alcohol-based linen spray, not Febreze, to cut down on odor-causing bacteria. Hosen, or tall socks coming to just above the knee, would also be worn. These items were made from woven fabric, usually wool, cut on the bias for a bit of stretch. They would be secured just below the knee with tied garters and then the excess height folded over the garter. Dresses in the mid, middle, midi, mid, medieval, mid, medieval. I'm not going to be able to say middle, it's just going to keep coming out medieval. Dresses in the mid medieval period were known as coats, coat hardies, kirtles, or sometimes just dresses. They could be cut looser, as is seen almost exclusively on middle and lower class people in manuscripts, but also sometimes on people of higher status. This style is incredibly comfortable, but something to note is that it is not self-supporting. So if you are a person in need of bust support, you will have to wear some kind of supportive undergarment, historical or un, with it. Coats could also be cut closer to the body, sometimes necessitating a front opening to get into, which could be laced or buttoned closed. It is also worth noting, however, that since wool is slightly stretchy, a coat made of it can be quite fitted while still allowing a person to wriggle in with no additional openings. Elin Abramson has a Getting Dressed in the Middle Ages video that shows this quite effectively. These tighter coat hardies could have long fitted sleeves that might feature a button closure between elbow and wrist or short sleeves that showed off the smock below. These shorter sleeved coats were especially useful for layering over another dress, great when it's chilly out, or for showing off separate pinned sleeves, a fantastic way to use costly fabric without breaking the bank. I recommend having at least one of each of these three items, unfitted kirtle or dress, long sleeved fitted coat, and short sleeve fitted coat in separate colors, as they are easy to layer over one another to create different looks. If possible, I recommend having two of either the fitted or unfitted long sleeve dresses to maximize versatility. Another great item to have is a sideless surcoat. Earlier in the period we're looking at, the surcoat has smaller, higher arm size and falls in an A-line from the bust. This garment is known as a cyclist. Keep an eye out for next week's video where I will be making one. And the other, slightly later version features very large arm size that dip down as far as the hips to more effectively show off the dress beneath. These are known as gates of hell surcoats and are what most people think of when they hear sideless surcoat. These can be worn over any of the aforementioned coats or combination of coats. The last thing to think about is headgear. Very few people went around with heads uncovered and feminine people far less than masculine. Up until now, I have been wearing a fairly plain cap called a hova or San Brigida cap in the pictures. These were worn on their own, most especially by those of lower or middle classes, but also serve as a wonderful base for other headwear. I recommend having at least one veil, oval or rectangle, these were both shapes that can be seen in manuscripts of the time, and a rectangular wimple. And these can be worn in a variety of ways. I actually have a class on veil wearing that I teach in the SCA, and I'll make sure to put a link to the handout in the description below. The other ubiquitous item of headwear is the hood. These were worn by all people and could be styled in multiple ways. They're a great way to keep the sun off of your face, neck, and chest in warmer weather, and to keep those same areas warm with a woolen hood in the cold. Here is what my proposed feminine capsule wardrobe looks like all together. Before we get started on the masculine side of things, I want to thank my partner Alden for willingly playing dress up for these pictures after spending most of the morning in the kitchen making an excellent peach pudding from a 1767 recipe. 
We start with a plain thigh length linen shirt with long sleeves and a pair of braids or undergarments not unlike modern boxers. Well, some are, some are cut more generously, but in essence they're a pair of linen shorts worn under all other garments. Just like the feminine underclothing, these linen items serve to wick away sweat and protect the fashion garments from body oils. This increases the longevity of wear between washing. Many of the garments have a direct parallel between masculine and the feminine, so bear that in mind as we continue. Over the braids would be worn a pair of full leg hosen, also called chausses. The tops of these chausses are tied to the drawstring of the braids, making a kind of split-legged pair of pants. Again, these would be fastened at the knee with garters. Much like the more feminine side of the closet, masculine garments could be more loosely fitting, what we might call a tunic, or more closely fitted, again sometimes utilizing a fastened front opening to facilitate getting dressed. These more tightly fitted garments are also known as coats or coat hardies, like their feminine counterparts. The major difference between the two is garment length. Hemlines fluctuated a bit over the course of the 1300s, but the most common length was just below the knee. It was not uncommon to have a tunic reach ankle length, but the looser garments were almost never shorter than the knee. More body-hugging coats, however, could vary from knee length with a flared skirt to a fitted thigh-skimming mini skirt length. Again, like their feminine counterparts, coats could have short or long sleeves and could be worn layered one over another or over a tunic, especially easy if the coat was of the longer skirted variety. Often the overcoats would have decorative sleeve additions hanging from the elbows. Again, I generally recommend having at least one of these three items unfitted tunic, long-sleeved fitted coat, short-sleeved fitted coat, in different colors, as they are easy to layer over one another to create as many looks as possible. I do recommend having two of either the fitted or unfitted long-sleeved garments, again to maximize versatility. The masculine surcoat was cut similarly to the early feminine cyclist, being a sleeveless garment worn belted at the waist, but in this case, slit in the front and back for ease of riding and often worn over armor. In that capacity, it may have served to protect costly armor from the elements and been emblazoned with a knight's coat of arms to make them more easily recognizable on the field of battle. Again, headwear is an important element for our masculine medievalist. A close-fitted coif tied under the chin protected head and hair from the sun. Wide-brimmed hats made of wool felt were also popular, especially among pilgrims, and were often worn with the front or back of the brim pinned up. Hoods were also a masculine accessory worn in the traditional hood-like style, but also increasingly in the chaperon style, with the face opening worn on the top of the head and the hood skirt left to hang down to one side of the face. Here is what most of my proposed masculine capsule wardrobe looks like. Unfortunately, I don't have a short-sleeved overcoat to show here, so we'll just have to make do with this inserted drawing of one. Once clothing is taken care of, other accessories may be introduced to the capsule wardrobe as well. Belts, jewelry, aprons, and other hat styles all contribute to the different ways these wardrobes might be worn to create nearly endless versatility. Of additional interest is outerwear for the colder months of northern climes. There are several ways to deal with winter, both in materials, wool and silk, and with clothing, layering of items, and perhaps the addition of a winter cloak. I hope this has been a useful look into the myriad possibilities of a well-curated capsule wardrobe. Thank you all for coming along with me today. Please make sure to check out all of the other CocoVid videos and playlists out there, and join us for the hashtag parties on Instagram. Also, be sure to claim your badge for this class by scanning this QR code or going to Badge Wallet and typing in the code shown on your screen now. As always, friends, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Will. Yes? What do you want? Yeah? Really? Teapot over. 
Come on. No, not over there. That's not helpful. <laughs>